I'm Dr. Brent Krasick. Um, I've been at ARL for about seven years. Um, prior to ARL, I was at uh, First University of Illinois where I got my PhD in physics and then at uh, the Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas. Um, throughout my career, I've been working on multi-scale models and a lot of the working toward understanding how we can connect the fundamentals of the multi-scale models to some specific physical problems. And so what I'm going to talk about today is using a lot of the ideas that Ken has just talked about, which saves me on talking about a lot of the things he talked about, to some specific applications that we're working on in electronic materials. So moving from one CRA, the one having to do with um, extreme environments, to the electronic materials. Um, so um, basically, as we've been discussing things, as you've heard today, there are many specific problems that the Army is worried about. And in the area of electronic issues, um, one of the key areas that the Army is interested in is developing the devices that we need to be able to overcome specific challenges. One of these challenges is communication. For example, in, the, um, in a mega city where you need, you're limited on line of sight, where we may have jamming. And so one of the key ideas behind this is to use um, ultraviolet communication that you can bounce off the ozone layer. You know how the ozone layer protects us from being sunburned. We can go, use it the other way as well. This is one application. Other applications, we're interested in a lot of different laser applications from directed energy to manufacturing at the point of need. Um, in each of these cases, one of the key material families that the Army is really interested in is the nitride semiconductors. Um, nitrides are active in the blue and the UV, which provides a lot of these portions of the spectrum that we're currently interested in. They're also able to handle very high amounts of energy. They're much more resilient to high power than a lot of the other semiconductors that we know. So the nitrides are very important. That's why we're going to focus on nitrides. But a lot of the stuff I'm talking about here, we're actually looking at applications to gallium arsenide as well and to some of the materials that are used for night vision, so merc mercury, cadmium, telluride. In the context of what's being done in the technical community right now, um, for the most part, the way this modeling is done is it's done in a what we would consider a sequential multi-scale fashion. That is, you compute the parameters that you think are going to be important. You do this in a combinatorial fashion as best you can. And then you use that to bootstrap into um, your higher scale models um, for simulating the devices themselves. Um, there have been some different approaches to this. But for the most part, that is what the approaches are currently limited to. And so what I'm going to talk about today is using a lot of the same ideas that Ken talked about, where we want to be able to do what's called adaptive sampling so we can address many more parameters than are possible in our, than doing a straight combinatorial pre-computation so that we can more accurately, accurately represent the materials that we're seeking to model. Um, what does this support? The cyber and electromagnetic technologies and complex environments, ERA, obviously. And also, there are a lot of other places, I, as I noted. So, um, I already said a lot of what's on this slide, but let me just focus on this, on this figure right here. This figure is a schematic. It's not representing what often goes into these semiconductor devices. In this case, you would have a lot of different layers of different alloys of gallium nitride. So these alloys include, you had aluminum, you had indium, um, different things. And then, um, depending on how you structure the material, you get different response out. Depending on how you dope it, you get different response out. We want to be able to um, predict ahead of time, be able to say, this type of material, this type of doping, this type of layering will give us this type of response. Right now, the best we can do is we can do some um, measurements, we can do some calculations, but um, we're not able to do too, true prediction of material properties. And that's where we'd like to head. And that's a lot of the, um, the direction that both of these CRAs that we've talked about are really focused on, is how do we do too, true predictive modeling. Um, and so this is part of a collaboration, as I said. We have the um, ARL Materials Enterprise, which is here within ARL. We have the MISMI, which is the CRA we talked about for electronic materials. There's also an ARL Center for Semiconductor Modeling. This effort here is to bring in a lot of these computational science aspects into the other modeling that's happening within this center. So um, the, on the theory side, we have several collaborators in the materials campaign. Um, on the side of actually doing the microscale models for these materials, we have external collaborators, in particular Enrico Bellotti at Boston University, we've collaborated with very um, closely. 
Uh, we haven't collaborated as much with Francesco Bertazzi yet, but that is on the, it's in the future plans. That's, that's set up already. We're also working with um, experimentalists in the materials campaign to validate some of these models. Um, but right now, what I'm going to talk about is a central part where we're, we're working about, worrying about the computational sciences aspect of this. Um, where's my computer? Where do I need to point this? There we go. Okay, so for this specific model, we have essentially six components that we want to put into it. I'm going to talk mostly about component number three here. I'm going to talk a little bit about component number one. Those are the two I've personally worked on the most. Um, I've also been collaborating with Bilotti once again at Boston University on number two, and then four, five, and six are in the future. So specifically, what are we looking at? We need a macro scale model. In this case, we're going to look at how does a laser propagate within a nitride material. Um, we need to have the micro scale model of the material as it responds to the illumination. And then we have to have, we're going to use machine learning um, using Gaussian process regression as Ken discussed. In this case, though, we want to be able to capture the internal states of the material. So we're going to be targeting many more parameters within our machine learning than Ken was discussing. They want to go there as well, but we're finding that we need to do this sooner than they do. And so that's how we're approaching this. We believe that, um, that this type of approach will enable the sort of high fidelity modeling that we want to do of the micro scale um, plugged into the macro scale in order to allow us to do materials by design and ultimately to um, be able to integrate this into doing actual um, device design using these types of approaches. Um, there we go. Um, so Ken talked about the basics, um, went over how this whole multi-scale hierarchical multi-scale method works. The basic idea is we have a macro scale, we have a micro scale, and then we have a lot of stuff in between, which um, hopefully will reduce the total amount of computation we have. And in particular, if you look right here at this representation of the laser pulse pa passing through our, um, our semiconductor, um, this we would represent by some sort of uh, continuum model. In this case, we'll say we were using a finite element mesh. We would want to know the, mac the micro state at every point on this mesh. That can be a lot of calculation. But at the, sa at the same time, as was noted before, there's a lot of symmetry that's going to be in this problem. Um, if we can exploit that symmetry and use adaptive sampling and use um, and create these types of databases in a sense through our machine learning approach, then we should be able to reduce the cost of the cal computation significantly. Um, so on the macro scale then, what we're using is we're using, um, we're using this model here right now. We've, we've had some discussions with some other people who do um, electros electrodynamic modeling. This particular model, though, allows us to reduce the laser propagation problem to what is essentially a um, fluid dynamics type problem, uh, the commonly known, um, this is the advection diffusion reaction equation. Um, so we can leverage a lot of the stuff that has been developed already for continuum models. The biggest difference here is that um, this is complex rather than real. We have to deal with complex numbers in this case, but it it seems to work just fine. We haven't had too many problems. We can then divide this equation into two parts, one which is pure macro scale, and then one which incorporates all the micro scale inputs that we put in. Thus far, we've um, used empirical parameters that we've plugged into this part here. We have not yet been able to get the, we've not yet gotten the, the mic micro scale incorporated. So it's not a true multi-scale method, but we're, we're on our way to that point. So only the micro scale is not the nonlinear response is all represented through the micro scale. That, that's correct. Um, so, depending on how hard you drive a system, um, the, the system with the laser, you know, at, at low amplitude, there's essentially no nonlinear response at all. As you drive it harder, the material itself responds in a nonlinear manner, and we would like to represent that through our um, through our micro scale equations because that's where it comes in. And presumably, if we do our um, if we do our regression properly. That won't re that won't increase the cost too much. That's you know, we'll see where that goes. Um, okay, so as I noted, this can be rewritten as the advection diffusion reaction equation. Micro scale comes in through this point, and our quote unquote multi physics solution here using empirical parameters, but the same machinery that we will use when we put in the actual micro scale responds as we expect we get something that's known as um, self-focusing of the laser. 
Um, this is a well-known phenomenon that's been studied both experimentally and computationally. Um, as far as going to a multi, true multi-scale where we include the high fidelity models, um, doing a simple back of the envelope calculation, as Ken was saying, the minimum number of CPUs we're, look, CPU hours we're looking at is about three billion. Um, as we increase the complexity of our models, obviously that's going to increase. And so already the simplest model that we might try to do without doing some sort of surrogate modeling is intractable. And so we need to find more efficient ways to do this. Um, and um, I will put in my acknowledgement here, well, as I said before, this is all based on the work that's been done in the Bellotti group with this microscale model for gallium nitride specifically. And that's the model I'm going to use as we move into the, uh, as we move into the uh, incorporating the microscale model as well. Um, uh, why this problem has more uh, uh, higher dimensional parameter space? Um, the reason this, this has a higher dimensional parameter space is we, we don't have, I mean, so in Ken's case, they started out with a very specific problem that they could do with just a few degrees of freedom. In this case, the um, deformation of the material and just those parameters that they could extract from the DPD. Um, we could potentially do that. Um, but the, the population profiles, which you'll see as soon as I change the slide now that I can, um, will, um, we find that we need more parameters to simply represent the internal states. And so in a sense, you might say that we skipped the step that they did by not using fewer parameters, but I don't really know of a good model that we could use that would not incorporate that many parameters. And that's really where we're stuck at the moment. So this, this shows what I was talking about. Um, as calculated in the microscale model, we have um, four, essentially four different parameters at that's over 5,000 bins. So we're looking at on the order of 20,000 parameters that are used to represent the microscale at every time step. Now, 20,000 parameters is out of reach for Gaussian process regression right now. And frankly, we don't want to deal with that much data anyway. But it looks like we can reduce it down to somewhere on the order of about 100 parameters that we can use to represent these internal states. And it turns out that unless you're actively illuminating the material itself, you don't even need that many. You only need about half that. So we're, we're hoping to get away with about somewhere between 50 and 100 parameters. It's still a lot, but that, that is considered to be accessible to these types of um, regression solutions. Um, and so to get a sense of what we actually need out of this, um, these are our states, as we saw in the last slide. If you take a mean over 5,000 simulations, you can see the mean is pretty smooth. There are a few features here. Um, I'm guessing we won't capture that one there, but we'd like to capture most of the rest of them. But the other thing that we need, because we're representing something that is a, a statistical sampling of the, of the system, we also need to get the standard deviation right. We need to have a representation of the statistical response of the material. And so what we're seeking then is we're seeking to capture from our, our calculations, we want to capture a representation of the, of what we would get so that at any point, as was mentioned before, we could restart the calculation, we can seed it with reasonable parameters and calculate the next point. In this case, because our microscale is time dependent, we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to step forward with each new step. And so some of our input parameter then is the previous step. Well, we also have to incorporate the incoming um, radiation. So that's what we're going to capture. As I mentioned before, we have you know, 20,000 states that we want to get. And the big question is, you know, I showed uh, an average over 5,000, but I wanna, don't want to have to do 5,000 calculations for every mic microscale point. The question is, can we extract from a single calculation all the data we need to get that representation? And so that's the question I'm going to focus on in the balance of my talk. And we looked at different potentials, what surrogate models might we use. Um, looked at PCA. PCA is not doing well with this problem. And so we just dropped it. So it's, it's not going to get there. We can look at interpolative methods, um, such as stochastic collocation or something, but most cases there, at least the base of those models, they assume that the points are exact, whereas we want to capture the noise as well. Not only that, but if we go back to this slide before, we'll notice that as far as bin, by bin number goes, the standard deviation varies by orders of magnitude, and so that we need a representation that can capture that as well within the noise. Where is the computer? I'm, oh, is it here? Oh, just hidden next here. All right. So 
So then um, we are going to go with Gaussian process regression. The only thing is that we're going to have to do some external fitting and tuning to, to develop our regressional models. So what I'm going to show you is, is the baseline. We've, we've looked at some different approaches as well on top of this, but this is how we've, where we started out. Basically, if we do some, take that curve that we saw, do some sort of mean, from a, do some sort of fit to obtain a mean, and then once we subtract off the mean, obtain a standard deviation, and then from that mean plus standard deviation, run our regression and see if we can get a, a model out that represents the data we have, both the value and the noise. And so one, you know, mean, standard deviation together giving us Gaussian process regression. It's imperfect. Um, and we're looking at some different types of kernels to improve this, but it works. Um, and it, as I said, it reduces the number of degrees of freedom significantly. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. I presume you understand this, or if not, it's not that important. Um, we're using a fairly standard kernel right now. One of the things that I've been looking at recently is some use of some different kernels to improve upon that. Um, and so, um, I'll skip down here. So looking in terms of statistics, how does this match up statistically? From our regression, if I go ahead then and I generate a new 5,000 set of new 5,000 samples based on this mean and standard deviation, do I match the original statistics? The answer is it's imperfect. Um, the, um, in particular, the, uh, the regression itself is very sensitive to the calculated standard deviation. So any errors that we have within the standard deviation itself get amplified. And so as I said, we're looking at some different means to uh, capture that better. Um, obviously where the data goes to zero, we have issues with the skew and the kurtosis in particular. But overall, the match appears to be pretty good. And when you plug it back into the Monte Carlo simulation, the microscale model that we were using before, it can just take off and move as it had previously. So that's a good sign. It looks like we're on track to having the system work together. Um, and so, um, did I have a slide in for a roadmap? I'm going to do the roadmap first, come back to the conclusions. So basically, this is our target. Somewhere beyond 2022, um, having some materials by design capability. Um, this is something that is of great interest. We have, as I said, the Semiconductor Modeling Center. Um, the CERDEC Night Vision is quite interested in these types of approaches. Um, and for communications and other, the other applications, we'd like to be able to at least have a start of being able to get this to work within that time frame, somewhere within about the next five years. So on the left side here, we have the, the track that I've essentially described right now. Um, hopefully within you know, two, three year time frame, we'll have a, an adaptive sampling based multi-scale method working based on the, the, the um, specific topics I discussed. Um, as, that, as that matures, then we'll start to incorporate defects. We'll start to incorporate how do you deal with the, inter the layers, the interfaces between these layers. And those things, as I said before, those will be handled through collaboration as well, working with the Bertazzi group in um, Torino in Italy. And then the final thing is that we have been talking with people within the, um, within the materials campaign um, about we've been working on some things that we can do for uncertainty quantification and also validation to put into these models. And so that's an ongoing thing. I don't have a good timeline on that yet. There's, I will say this. We hope to have a, one paper on validation out this year um, based on the microscale model itself particularly. And um, so then going back or coming then to the, the uh, conclusions here, we have we have a macroscale solver that works. We have a microscale solver that works. We appear to have an approach that will allow us to do the regression on the microscale so that we can plug it back in. And so we're putting together, assembling the components so that we can have a, micro, um, a, fully, a fully operating um, multi-scale model. And we're fortunate in this sense that we already have Ken's results. We know that the system that we're going to actually run, the, the um, the code, the libraries that we're going to use to make this work are already operational in their, in their um, projects, so we're not worrying about that so much right now. Instead, we've been working on assembling those pieces. Um, the regression models seem to work. There's some things we'd like to do a little bit better. We also would like to improve. Um, well, let me, once we have that, we believe this will improve upon the means that people have been doing these calculations in order to put the micro scale into the full um, the full type of calculations so that we can do these high fidelity models and capture the physics where the actual excitation is taking place. And I think that's where I'll stop. Quick questions? You mentioned that the equation you were solving, the reaction diffusion, uh, 
convection equation is linear, does that mean that that velocity v is constant? Uh, or not, sorry, not constant, but known? Oh, well, so um, that's a good question. Um, we're going to make that assumption right now. Obviously, the speed of light is fixed. Um, however, within a material that is under illumination, you have um, some polarization. The speed of light will vary a little bit. And of course, the direction will vary as well. Um, and so within the model itself, there's nothing that keeps us from using um, multiple macro scale solvers to handle different directions. And then there's some things that you can do with, um, with the phase to work through the delay having to do with the slight um, speeding up and slowing down the speed of light. It probably won't be a perfect match, but it'll be pretty close. So there's a reason you need so many uh, computational resources that they're great because of all of the different, the, the um, stochasticity of the problem. You, see you have all these like 100 or 1,000, 10,000 simulations, essentially each time step. So, so um, I, I, I hope that we don't have to deal too much with the stochasticity. As I mentioned, it looks like we can extract from a single calculation most of the information we need. It's pretty close. Um, the, the, the bigger issue is has to do with the different parameters. If you look at um, and come back here to this slide. If, if you consider that this is the evolution of those states, and as you illuminate it, the, um, the populations of the different carriers change. As it propagates in time and things relax, those, prop those populations change as well. So the big cost comes from moving from this state to the next state, either under illumination or not. How is that going to change? And as I said, that, if you were to just calculate it in a combinatorial fashion, is intractable. And so what we need instead is we need to use these adaptive sampling type methods so we can target the specific portions of the parameter space, of the phase space, so that we do the calculations that we need. And so in a manner similar to what Ken discussed, we would pick out and do the calculations as needed where they're needed. Um, and that's where the real cost comes in. The, the, the uh, finite element solver compared to the microscale solve is essentially free. Okay, that's really what it comes down to. So is your bin index energy or momentum? Um, momentum, yeah. Which um, for, for many semiconductors, as long as you don't drive them too hard, um, there's, a, there's a fairly simple relationship between the momentum and the energy. In the case of nitrides, you can't assume that it's quadratic, but in many semiconductors, it is. It's simply a quadratic relationship. Uh, how so far into the out into those states we're, we're taking? At the moment, we're not. Um, I think I'm going to say that falls under the under the that falls under collaboration here, where we, we rely on our partners who are working specifically on the microscale representation on how they want to do that. I don't understand this curve. If it's momentum, is it momentum? I mean, it's too smooth. I mean, they, right? With the, with their, there are three direct, three basis directions, right? So we're. So, how does that so in the place, in the portions of the, um, in the portions of the, um, the Brillouin zone, and the the specific dispersion surfaces within the Brillouin zone where the electrons and holes tend to stay, um, those are essentially spherically symmetric. And so in this case, we're making that assumption. Um, there are situations where you. Same thing then. In essence, yes. Okay. That, that's why, why you have the quadratic relationship. Um, in Bellotti's group, they have a, a different code that, will actually, that does actually account for that, where they have different directions. Um, that's actually, it's in my roadmap, but I didn't stress it. That's, that's something we're going to get this working first before we dra drastically increase our number of degrees of freedom again. Um, but presumably there and here, there are a lot of degrees of freedom, but you're not going to explore the full space, right? Instead, you're going to have very specific sections of the space of the, the space of parameters that are very active. But most of it won't be active at all. And so by using these sampling techniques, we can avoid those portions of the phase space completely. Yes? So, so Brent, uh, quick question. I mean, I can appreciate the engineering challenges involved in putting something like that together, right? Mm -hmm. But what are the, the, the science challenges? You know, where, where, where are the new research uh, in, in building a system like that, in doing what you want to do? Well, so, so a, lot of, a lot of the research is, um, 
is going to focus on this development of the adaptive sampling and how do we deal with Okay, so are you saying that that type of... No, 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 I mean, I, I just want to articulate, and I wanted to listen to hear from you, you know, which area you think is going to be like the new research that you, know, you guys are going to do here at ARL versus the stuff you're going to rely on collaborators and so forth. So, so that is, that is this, this, this type of sampling, how do we do the representation of the states? How do we handle just the vast volumes of data? Can we represent it in manners that will allow us to, to render these calculations tractable? Um, Representing large volumes of data is it a, is a question of you know how you deal with the HPC side of things? So is no, it, no, no we're, we're looking at this algorithmically. It, it comes back to this regression process. It's it's more the the mathematics behind. So really, how do you build those those, those reduced order models? That's right. How do we build these models? How do we handle the different types? Um, we're looking at use of different kernels sure. within the Gaussian process regression itself to to in order to capture this information with as few degrees of freedom as possible. Okay. Let's, let's bring up the Thank terms you. there.